Deep in the forests and jungles of Faerun can be found the faithful Malar. There they hunt in the name of their bloodthirsty patron deity, all the while thinking of violent ways to make the civilized world fear them. I'm Ben Dignan, and welcome once again to Religion in the Realms. Titles Malar goes by the following titles. The Beast Lord, the Black-Blooded Pard, the Stalker, the Lord of Beasts, the Ravaging Bear, and the Black-Blooded One. Malar has four aliases in the Forgotten Realms. In the Vilhan Reach, he is known as the Stalker. Around the frigid Endless Ice and the Great Glacier, he is known as the Render. Finally, the orcs who live within the High Forest call him Hearn. Portfolio and Domains Malar's portfolios are Bloodlust, Evil Lycanthropes, Hunters, Marauding Beasts and Monsters, and Stalking. Malar's suggested domain for 5th edition is Nature. Appearance and Manifestations Malar has two known appearances. The first is known as the Beast, and is the far more known of the two. The Beast is said to look like some feline, man-high, blood-spattered black-furred beast that prowls about. The talons and fangs of the Beast drip unceasingly with blood. In this form, Malar only communicates via vicious snarls and growls. Malar's lesser-seen humanoid form is known as the Master of the Hunt, or the Wild Hunter. In this form, Lar stands 12 feet tall, covered with black fur, with red eyes, and a rack of antlers protruding from his head. Rather than a nose and mouth, a large orifice draped over with flesh is in the center of his face. Lar can speak while in this form. The master of the hunt is often accompanied by 21 fiendish wolves. In his humanoid form, he carries a plus 5 long spear and two plus 5 daggers all with the keen and unholy qualities in 3rd edition mechanical terms. Malar's avatars have adopted these two appearances while down on the surface at various times. Malar makes use of two manifestations on the surface of Faerun. The first is a dark cloud with two feral red eyes in the midst of it. Out of this cloud can be heard all sorts of bestial sounds, though typically snarling laughter is heard from the cloud. The second is a conjured animated beast limb Malar can cause to move about in order to point, draw symbols, write out letters that look like blazing blood in the area, manipulate objects, or lash out at someone or something. Along with a summoned limb is a deeply unnerving snarl. Malar can also show his favor and disfavor with the appearance of different predatory creatures. These include beasts of Malar, bears, jackal wares, Gargantua, wolf wares, wolverines, orimvore, wolves, displacer beasts, fang dragons, lucrotas, evil lycanthropes, owl bears, and peritons. Very rarely, Malar is said to be able to even bring about the Tarask, though there is no mention of this being recorded in Faerunian history to my knowledge. Abilities Malar is said to have the ability to smell and taste the fear of those he hunts. As a lesser deity, Malar can choose to take a 10 on any check. Ones are also treated normally, rather than as an automatic failure. Malar has divine senses that allow him to sense out to a distance of 10 miles. He can sense such things that are within 10 miles of his worshippers, holy sites, objects, or locations where his name or one of his titles has been spoken within the last hour. He can split out his senses and feel out to five different locations at once. He can also block out the divine senses of any other deity of his divine rank or lower for a 10 hour period. Malar has a portfolio sense that allows him to sense any hunt so long as the hunt in question affects 500 people or more. While that might seem like a ludicrous number, I will explain later that Malar is likely aware of the hunts that his followers intentionally drive through a given town or village. 
these hunts do have the potential to affect such a large amount of people. Likewise, Malar can sense whenever an evil lycanthrope takes on their beast or hybrid form. Malar can make magic items that are made with some degree of natural material or magic items that can assist in hunting, so long as those items do not exceed 30,000 gold pieces. In his Master of the Hunt form, Malar can seemingly allow his antlers to melt away to keep them from snaring on anything, especially when in combat, but then grow them back instantly later. He will still use these antlers to impale and slash at his opponents. Malar is of course extremely good at hunting and tracking. However, he's still beat out both by Gwera and Winstrom and Maliki in both regards. When avatars could still be sent down to the Prime Material, Malar often would send his down to hunt and prowl. While doing so, it wasn't uncommon for an avatar to possess a member of his faith and induce a powerful frenzy and bloodlust in them. The blood that drips from Malar's avatar form of the beast, and likely from itself, has curative properties. The avatar was reluctant to give out such healing, but it did occur. His avatar could shape change between the form of the master of the hunt and the beast once per round. The avatar had access to very strong summoning magics that allowed them to summon various predatory creatures. Any bite from the beast avatar would inflict lycanthropy. Which form of lycanthropy was brought about by this bite was determined randomly. Should the master of the hunt lose both his grips on his spear, it would vanish only to then reappear in his hand at will. Each avatar form had regenerative capabilities. Wounds and mutilations heal an even greater amount when the avatar shape change between their two forms. Both avatar forms were immune to any charm spells or spell-like effects and could not be forced to change into a form, say through a spell like True Polymorph. Personal History Malar is said to be a primordial deity. Though it appear he is not mentioned as one of the deities birthed out of the conflict between Selune and Shar at the dawn of time on Toril. So long as wild animals have lived and prowled around on the surface, Malar has existed in some capacity. The earliest date I can find for any record of Malar is circa negative 17,600 Dale Reckoning. Corallon Lorethian warded Evermeet against Lolth, Malar, and other enemies to the Seldarine following the events of the First Sundering. The origins of lycanthropy in the Forgotten Realms are thought to have ties to both Malar and Salune. More specifically, those versions of lycanthropy tied to an evil alignment are thought to have been brought about by Malar, gifting early human groups with the power to emulate the predatory animals they showed a deep veneration for, whereas the origins of lycanthropy tied to good lycanthropes is said to have been a gift from Salune to human children left to survive out in the wild places of the world. For those of you who have listened to any of the episodes of The Dead Three, that being Ball, Mercule, and Bane, you will recall the tale of the Knucklebones, Skull Bowling, and the Empty Throne. This tale tells of how Jurgle wished to abdicate his power to these three who were mortals at the time. But to determine who chose which of Jurgle's portfolios first, a game of Skull Bowling was called for. Malar somehow caught wind of this and tried to intervene, chasing down the skulls as they were thrown across Hades. Malar desired a piece of Jurgle's power for his own. However, by the time he returned with the three skulls, the three mortals had resolved their dispute with a game of knucklebones. My rough estimate of this event would be around negative 350 Dale Reckoning. At some time after the fall of Nethril, which is admittedly a very large time frame, Malar came to exist in the alliance of the evil nature deities known as the Gods of Fury with Talos at its head. At some time close to this, I would imagine, Talos was able to imprison Malar in the outer plane of Carceri. Much as he's done with Umberly and Auril, so too does Talos encroach and steal away some of the influence Malar has in the Forgotten Realms. Thus, Malar has been able to reach out successfully to some other non-human groups, and they in turn have started worshipping him. Malar has also slain some totem spirits worshipped by human groups and subsumed their portfolios. One such being the Blue Bearer as they were known by the Uthgart, or the Render as they were known in the frozen regions of northern Faerun. Malar also defeated and subsumed the portfolio of a deity known as Hearn. 
Hearn was an interloper deity who long ago made his way into the Forgotten Realms. Hearn in particular was worshipped by orcs who lived in the High Forest. Now the orcs regard Malar as Hearn and worship him accordingly. In the first edition era of the Forgotten Realms, Malar held the rank of a demi-power. From the time of Troubles onwards, represented by second edition though, as he took over the portfolios of these other entities, he was able to raise himself up to the position of a lesser deity. During the time of Troubles in 1358 Dale Reckoning, a weakened Malar fought and lost to Nobunayan and Emerald Enclave Druids in the Gulfmir Forest found in the Vilhan Reach. This battle came to be known as the Roar of Shadows. Malar then fled up to the northern reaches of Faerun, where he subsequently attracted the attention of Gweron Winstrom. For the remainder of the Time of Troubles, Gweron remained in pursuit of Malar, Malar never being able to lose Gweron. To finish this discussion of Malar's history, it is worth talking about a certain creature who falls under his influence. This creature is known as Ityak or Theol, otherwise known as the Elf Eater. At first in older sources, Ityak or Theol was said to have been created by Malar, only for it to be said that it was born out of the mixed blood of Grumsh and Corallon as they fought during the mythic ages of the universe in later sources. For millennia, this creature has been summoned out of the abyss by some power to wreak havoc on elven communities. At some time, Malar came to know and control this creature, and at least once a century has Malar managed to summon it, summon it to Faerun. The most recent occurrence happened in 1365 Dale Reckoning, where Malar determined the location of an elven portal to ever meet on the Moonshay Isles. Ityak Orthiel was summoned and destroyed many things alongside the portal itself before being banished back to the abyss. The Elf Eater is a tall alien creature standing at 30 feet. It stands upon three thick trunk-like legs. Its round blobby body is covered over top by a hard dome-shaped carapace. On the underside of this creature is a toothless maw that the creature stuffs its meals into, grinding them down with hard cartilage on the inside of its mouth. 140 feet long sucker tentacles thrash about in an attempt to grab hold of any elf it senses to eat up. It has a powerful ability to sense living things out to a range of 5 miles, despite having no eyes or ears. Personality Malar is a chaotic evil deity. As I mentioned earlier in 1st edition Forgotten Realms, Malar was a demi-power, though 2nd edition through to 3rd edition, he held the rank of a lesser deity. That is very likely the case in 5th edition as well. Malar has an unceasing hunger, and he pursues those things he desires with savagery and bloodlust in his heart. The sheer terror caused by his bearing and presence is joyful to him. He is jealous of those who have attained greater power than himself. Though it is said due to his limited intelligence and cunning, he is not able to excel past his current standing, failing to grasp what is needed to be done in order to increase his standing. Personal Realms In the Great Wheel Cosmological Model used in 1st Edition, 2nd Edition, and is the assumed model for 5th Edition Forgotten Realms, Malar resides on the split neutral evil and chaotic evil outer plane of Carceri. Specifically, Malar's realm the land of the hunt can be found on the fourth layer of Carceri, known as Colothus. Carceri has several names and titles which include the Tartarian Depths of Carceri, Tartarus, the Red Prison, and the Great Cage. Carceri is often considered to be a prison given the difficulty in finding a way out of the plane, especially more so if a creature has been specifically imprisoned here by some entity or other being. However, Carceri is one of the easiest outer planes to gain entrance into, with many portals that lead to the first layer of the plane. Carceri's form is a little more unusual, and a bit more difficult to grasp than other outer planes I find. The best way of thinking of Carceri is like a pearl necklace. Each pearl of the necklace then has six different shells, consisting of the outside surface which makes up the first layer, moving inwards towards the sixth layer near the core. The layers of Carceri are made up of these shells of each pearl that share the same number. 
For example, Malar's realm of the land of Hunt is found on the fourth layer of Carceri known as Colothus. That means for however many pearls there are in Carceri, Colothus is made up of all the fourth shells of every pearl. Then much like the pearl necklace example, each pearl shares an orbit much like they were connected on a massive and uncomprehensibly long string that connects each pearl of Carceri. However, to add another layer of complexity to this whole plane's construction, the distance between each pearl and Carceri depends on which layer you are on. The pearls on the first layer are separated by 100 miles or less. Comparatively, the pearls on the fifth layer are separated by millions of miles, and the pearls on the sixth layer have not even been ascribed a distance given how far they are separated. Despite the massive gulfs that might exist between the pearls on certain layers, travel to other layers both above and below on the same pearl is relatively easy, in that if you are on the fourth layer of the pearl that Malar's realm is on, it is easy enough to make your way up to the third layer and onwards or downwards and onwards should you find unnecessary portals or intraplanar conduits. The river Styx winds its way across the uppermost layer of Carceri from pearl to pearl. Should a person be willing to pay the necessary toll, it may serve as one of the safest methods to get from pearl to pearl. Carceri inherently has no day or night cycle. If a powerful entity is capable of creating one, they can manifest it for their partitioners and realms. Regardless, Carceri is lit by a dim red glow that is brighter on the outer layers compared to the inner layers. The colors of objects and people have a distinct ruddy hue to them, as if you were looking through blood-red colored lenses. Wind does carry across the plane, but it brings along a fetid and foul stench with it. If strong enough, it can make one nauseous or confused. Each layer of Carceri houses petitioners of a given evil disposition and has its own physical characteristics. But one thing holds true across each layer, do not trust any petitioner on Carceri. There is a reason they ended up here in the first place. The fourth layer, Colothus, houses petitioners who are known for their cheating and lies. The terrain that makes up Colothus is mountainous and treacherous. The mountains ascend hundreds of miles into the sky, and their slopes are sheer. This is where Colothus drives its nickname, Climber's Doom. Dangerously strong winds howl in between the many chasms here, and precarious bridges and trails wind their way in, a, in an attempt to facilitate travel as best as possible. Petitioners choose to live upon the mountain slopes, for at the base of these mountains, they are exposed to avalanches and demons making their way through the plain. The pearls or orbs on the fourth layer are spaced out half a million miles between one another. The land of the hunt is a small realm. It is one of the few level locations in Colothus, where a fair amount of flora grows. While our petitioners live in cave systems just above the ground. The petitioners arrange themselves in packs and inhabit their various dens in these caves. The largest of such dens containing around 4,000 such petitioners. A multitude of animals live here and can be hunted, but even the prey are just as dangerous as those who hunt them, if not stronger. This is intended as Malar desires to see the fittest survive. Whether unconsciously or consciously, Malar has given the land of the hunt an aura to it. Due to this aura, it is easier to pick up on sounds and scents so long as a creature has the intent to hunt in their soul. Malar himself may be found straying outside of his own realm in Karseri, both to satisfy his hunger, but also in an attempt to find a way of the prison Talos stuffed him into. There's far more to be said about Karseri as a whole, but we do have to move on. In the World Tree model used for 3rd edition Forgotten Realms, Malar resided on the plane of Fury's Heart. Fury's Heart is a plane made of wild and untamed terrain. Though this is a dangerously untamed plain to traverse where violent weather is constant, the creatures here are evil as well, many of which resemble bestial creatures, though are far more monstrous. Some of these creatures being nightmares and yeth hounds, though this plane is visited by other evil creatures like night hags. The petitioners who come to reside on this plane are violent and callous spirits. They take on elemental or bestial forms that take after their given patron deities. Unsurprisingly, petitioners of Malar take on bestial forms, 
though they take the form of fierce and primitive forms of what we know to be regular animals. Malar's realm on this plain is known as the Land of the Hunt. It is a massive open plain teeming with wildlife. Many of the wild creatures here have been transformed from souls stolen away from the Fugue Plain. The weather in this realm is rather hospitable compared to the other realms in Fury's Heart. Malar and his bestial petitioners hunt the variety of creatures here, though their attention is turned towards any intruders who find their way here. In the World Access model used in 4th edition Forgotten Realms, Malar came to reside in Sylvanus' domain known as the Deep Wilds, out in the Astral Sea. No buildings here have been built on this unspoiled expanse of wilderness. Malar's realm on this domain is still known as the Land of the Hunt. Near where Malar's realm meets all rules, the name of a forest known as the Forest of Gnashing Teeth is given. Unfortunately, no greater detail past these names is mentioned. Allies and Allegiances Malar is a member of the Gods of Fury. In this alliance of evil nature deities, Malar definitely seems like the black sheep. Neither Talos, Umberly, or Aurel have ever liked Malar and seem to just ignore him or shun him. While Malar simply despises the lot of them, wishing for their destruction. I speculate that given his past history with Talos, Talos has some sort of control and or hold over the Beast Lord. Outside the Gods of Fury, Malar has an established alliance of sorts with Lolf. Malar has seemingly always had a strong disdain for the surface elves and the Seldarine. Corallon and Malar once had a battle between the two of them sometime in the past, though no specifics of this battle are given. Other allies of Malar include Bane, Loviatar, and seemingly Kirin Sali from the Dark Zelda Ring, though I do have to imagine Loth is not all that pleased with that. Enemies Malar's chief foes include Nobanayan, Eldath, Myliki, Sylvanus, and though it is not recorded as such in any sourcebook, very likely the Elven Pantheon, also known as the Seldarine, and Gweron Windstrom. Malar is of course an enemy of Nobanayans given Malar's defeat at Nobanayans' hands during the Time of Troubles. Given the lack of concern for balance and harmony between wild and developed spaces, Malar is reviled by Sylvanus and the various deities that fall under the Oak Father's purview. Avatar and Deity Stat Blocks the second edition stat block for Malar's avatars can be found in the Face and Avatars supplement. The third edition stat block for both Malar himself and his avatars can be found in the Face and Pantheon supplement. Symbols In the Faerunian Pantheon, Malar's faith has only one known holy symbol. That is, a bestial claw with brown fur and bloody talons. Central Dogma from Faiths and Pantheons, a 3rd edition supplement. Quote, Survival of the fittest and the winnowing of the weak are Malar's legacy. A brutal, bloody death or kill has great meaning. The crux of life is the challenge between hunter and prey. The determination of who lives or dies. View every important task as a hunt. Remain ever alert and alive. Walk the wilderness without trepidation, and show no fear in the hunt. Savagery and strong emotions defeat reason and careful thought in all things. Taste the blood of those you slay, and never kill from a distance. Work against those who cut back the forest and who kill beasts solely because they are dangerous. Slay not the young, the pregnant, or deep spawn, so that prey will remain plentiful. End quote. Presence of the Faith Those who typically worship Malar include hunters, evil lycanthropes, sentient carnivores, rangers, and druids. Malar has also made inroads with certain other non-human populations as well. Malar's clerics tend to hold a chaotic evil, chaotic neutral, or neutral evil alignment. Malar's faith is widely despised in regions across Faerun. Many do try to placate him with offerings of fresh and bloody meat, but often such offerings go ignored by Malar. Though hunters and trappers do reluctantly offer up prayers to Malar, given his purview over hunting. 
Some even view Millar in a neutral light, thinking him to be representative of wild and graceful nature and natural predation. Malarites significantly mistrust other faiths, even those Millar is said to be allied with. Though temporary alliances may be struck if the very survival of a hunt is at risk. Millar has one known chosen. Anth Millar is, or was, sources never say whether he is currently dead or not, a human male who resides in the Silver Marches region of Faerun. Showing great disdain and hatred for the settlements in the area, Anth Millar organized the Furious Hunt, a hunt to take the form of a great assault on these settlements. Anth Millar was able to make use of a concoction that would cause lycanthropy to emerge in a person within seconds rather than days. The greatest amount of detail about Anth Millar can be found in Dungeon Magazine issue 129. Isar Cronenstrom is a powerful and tyrannical chieftain from the tribe of the wolf in Icewind Dale. He is a devoted Malarite, but he is incorrectly thought to be a chosen of Malar. He is a psychotic warrior who howls when in battle and drives himself into a frenzy. He is present in the 5th edition module Icewind Dale, Rhyme of the Frost Maiden. The faith of Malar is at its most civil in Cormier. Here the crown of Cormier and the Malarites have an understanding. Malarites breed dangerous monsters in Cormier. Those monsters are then hunted for sport by Cormierian nobles or hunted down by the Malarites to then provide meat to fill the tables of Cormierian nobles. In turn, the Malarites receive a large amount of coin. Their very presence of the Malarite faith also serves as a large deterrent for would-be raiders and invading forces, while keeping down the monster population with their regular hunts. The Crown of Cormier does keep control over the activities of the Malarites, however. In particular, the war wizards scry and police their activities. The faith of Malar is heavily represented out in the rural and wild spaces of the world, though the Beast Lord does have some adherents in urban settings. In urban areas, worshippers will stage their own hunts in an appropriate setting as possible. Hunts may be placed in the large gardens of some rich Malarite's estate, down within the sewers, or within the very walls of a Malarite temple if one is present. Within the High Forest, there are a collection of orc tribes who long ago abandoned the worship of their own racial pantheon in, a favor, in favor of a deity known as Hearn. Hearn was slain by Malar some time ago, and Malar has subsumed that name unbeknownst to the orcs of the High Forest. In the Vilhan Reach, Malar is known by the alias of the Stalker. In this region, Malarites are known for their violence in pursuit of the Druids. Here too, other non-humans worship Malar, including goblinoids, orcs, kobolds, sentient evil wolves, and some giant kin. Hierarchy and Structure of the Clergy The names given to the clergy of Malar differ upon which source book you go by. These names include Blood Hunters, Beasts, Lords of the Hunt, and or Hunt Lords. Various bands of Malarites may operate openly or hidden within the wild places across the continent. As I mentioned before, in Cormier, some Malarites are allowed to operate openly and hunt, while those that are zealous and bloodthirsty are shunned and hunted down. There is no central authority in the Malarite faith, unsurprisingly. Rather, the faith is composed of several cells called hunts. These hunts often act independently of one another. This can make it hard for enemies of the Malarite faith and removing the influence of Malar in a given region. Each hunt is led by an individual known as the Hunt Master. The Hunt Master is in charge of determining when, where, and what will be the prey in upcoming ceremonial hunts. The title of Hunt Master is won by a fight to the death between the current holder and challenger, or it may be passed on should a Hunt Master need to remove themselves from their responsibility for whatever reason, be it old age, injury, or the like. Some honorifics are used in the Malarite faith. The title of Old Hunter is given to a senior Malarite clergy member. Other honorifics are given on an individual basis to denote what powerful creature a certain Malarite has hunted and killed. Responsibilities and Duties of the Faithful Malarites hunt often, and they make it a point to make the hunt difficult on themselves as well as their prey. A particular dangerous path will be sought during a hunt in order to do so. 
If possible, Malarites will drive their prey into a settled area where others live. There they will make the kill in front of others. Unsurprisingly, the vast majority of people are disgusted and annoyed by this process. But that is by design. Malarites pay no mind to the concerns of others, and hunts only increase the disdain and fear of themselves in Malar. While other nature deities like Sylvanus and Myliki preach the need to keep the balance between the wild spaces and the expansion of development, Malar and his faith do not respect the concept of the balance. Malarites willingly conduct raids and vandalize settlements without any concern. This comes from the belief that the strong should both win out and rule over the weak. Malarites are directed to kill any Nobenai clergy they come across on site. Orders and Priestly Bodies The people of the Black Blood are a loose organization of Malarite lycanthropes and lycanthrope worshipping humanoids, mostly found in the northern forests of Faerun, though pockets exist elsewhere, like in Chult. In the north, those of the Black Blood are mostly humans from former Uthgar tribes. Their formation is tied to a tale of Malarites losing out to Selune worshipping lycanthropes. Malar recognized a need to assemble a more powerful force to maintain the strength of worship and fear of his name. Thus the people were formed. Those raised and welcomed into this organization are taught to embrace an animalistic and violent nature. The people prefer to raise their own young, though they will kidnap children from nearby settlements if their numbers are low and things are dire. As one's time passes in the black blood, they are taught and ultimately forced into behaving in an animalistic fashion. They go through many different tests and rigors to acclimate to the wild around them. Those who have spent significant time in the black blood bear an animalistic appearance, growing out and hardening their nails like claws and filing their teeth into fangs. Estimates place the membership of the Black Blood at 3,000 people or more. The Black Blood are territorial, but not expansionist. They hold a burning hatred for urban settlements and the people found in such places. But they only will attack such places to enact vengeance for what they perceive to be an attack against their people and or their territory. They are self-dependent and not needing to rely on imports or trade. Each sect of the Black Blood is led by a shaman, who mechanically is usually a druid or sorcerer, or a single powerful individual or mated couple, depending on what source book you go by. If more than one type of lycanthrope is present within the group, usually those who share the same type of form enjoy a higher level of prestige in the group. They venerate the animal spirits of the wild world in a totemic fashion, but at the head of each sect is always the worship of the beast lord, though some veneration is also shown towards Talona. Each sect of the Black Blood operates independently with little to no communication between each other. The Black Blood does cooperate with other Malarites, allowing them to pass through their given territory. Clerics of Malar tend to stick to their own, leaving the leadership of the Black Blood to their shamans. Each group of the people have their own symbol, though it is more differentiated by scent than it is by appearance. Rather, the symbols used by the people of the Black Blood share a similar motif, a simple abstract humanoid torso with a claw growing out from the top where its head should be. The bottom of the symbol is then formed into a spike, so it can be stuck into the ground. Cults of the Moon are another lycanthrope worshipping tribal organization found in various pockets around Faerun. Unsurprisingly, Malar is their most venerated entity, though some show reverence to Shar given that they believe she has perverted the light of reflecting off the moon that forces lycanthropes to change form. The lycanthropes tolerate their humanoid servants as they carry out various tasks for them. While the humanoid cultists hold that one day the lycanthropes will form a major vanguard that will bring down all civilization. Three main bodies of this cult can be found in the cold wood to the north of Silvery Moon, within the forest of Cormanthor, and in the deep Jungles of Cholt. Beastmasters are solitary clergy members of Malar who distance themselves from contact with any other human. Living among predators in the wild places, they begin to take on animalistic traits themselves. So in touch and bound with their local predators, it is thought that they may share a form of limited telepathy with them. They have druidic-like powers, though they themselves are not brought up in 
any druidic tradition. They are capable of summoning and or controlling a small force of predators without issue. It is rare for a beastmaster to call upon the aid of the hunts, but huntmasters often do not turn down such requests. Beastmasters are found somewhat often in the territory of druidic circles. This ties back to the desire for Malar as a whole to, comb- to combat the idea of balance preached by other druids with violence. Beast lords are a group of Malarite spellcasters devoted to the breeding and creation of monstrous and dangerous creatures. Most beast lords are human, though some are other intelligent creatures like illithids and beholders. Beast hearts are a specific body of Malarite clergy dedicated to taking on the animalistic and predatory traits of those creatures the faith holds in such high regard. Although not described to be a group of lycanthropes, they definitely have lycanthropic tendencies. They can appear human as they discuss their plans for an upcoming hunt amongst their fellows, though when the hunt is on, they take on an animalistic bearing, behaving and hunting much like a natural predator does. When a member first enters into the fold, they make a blood bond. They choose one type of mammalian predator. From that point onwards, they are not to harm that given type of animal. But in respect, no animal of that type will harm them either. As a given beast heart increases in level, they learn how to speak with an animal whom they share a beast bond with. Appearance and Dress Clergy wear ceremonial headdresses made from the pelts of the most powerful beasts the member has been able to kill with their bare hands. Often pelts are from bears or a great cat, but more powerful members have been seen with owlbear, displacer beast, or another powerful monster's pelt. On their hips, they carry a hunting horn. Malarites are often never found without several daggers carried down in the open, concealed, or both. Another favored weapon in the Malarite faith are Claws of Malar, otherwise known as Claw Bracers. These take the form of gauntlets or brass knuckles with metal claws that jet out from the fists. Malarites favor red and brown in their dress, but there is no specific uniform. Over top their clothes, they wear a practical cloak for blending into their surroundings, dyed with appropriate colors. A common accessory added to their ensemble are various hunting trophies like necklaces of animal bones, fangs, claws, and differing pelts. When adventuring, Malarite clergy favor a practical dress, though show a preference for clothes made from flexible animal hide. They will wear both or either animal pelts or necklaces made from the parts of those creatures they have hunted. Hopefully this signals their threat and capabilities to those around them. Beast hearts wear clothes made from rough spun material or from animal hides. Upon their head, they wear a headpiece made from the head of the most powerful creature they have slain, much like the rest of the faith. Around their necks, they wear a stone disc wrapped in a leather thong with the symbol of Malara scratched upon its surface. For weapons, they often make use of spears, battle axes, and two-handed swords. The odor said to be given off by a beast heart is likened to the mixture of human sweat, animal musk, and spilled blood. Rituals Clerics and Malara pray for their spells at night. It is best if this lines up on the night of a full moon. Prayers are offered up before a hunt, in the middle of it, then afterwards if successful. Often this may be even done with the blood of the quarry offered up as a toast. The blood of strong beasts and monsters is drank by some Malarites, with the belief that a degree of strength may be passed on to them through the practice, though the specifics are not given, however. Some Malarites are against such practices, as they think it is a denigration of powerful beasts that should be praised in Malar's name. The blood song is a droning song given over the carcasses of those slain in a hunt. There is mention of other specific rituals and prayers made when feasting upon one is slain, though no real details are given past that. The Feast of the Stags is an important ritual in the Malarite faith. Before conducting the feast, the Malarites will go out of their way to hunt more than usual in preparation. Specifically, this is done before a high harvest tide. The feast is called, and several non-Malarites are invited to this two-day-long feast. As Malarites come in on the day of the feast, they come parading with the heads of those creatures they have killed and prepared. At the feast, a pledge is made out to all, that the Malarites shall help to provide meat for the needy in cold winter months. The high hunts 
is by and large the most important Malarite ritual, and it is called for every season, though the people of Black Blood carry out their high hunts approximately once a month. The Malarites adorn themselves and are given hunting trophies as to pursue a certain humanoid over a day and night. This hunted humanoid can gain a boon from the Faith if they are able to escape from the hunters or last a set time period without being killed. The Malarites are only to hunt with a single knife or claw of Malar. The hunted individual is granted any non-magical weapons and armor they desire to as best challenge the Malarites in their hunt. Often druids of opposing faiths are sought out as offerings in the high hunt. If the hunted individual is slain, their entire body is burned, the belief being that the body is then offered up in sacrifice as a meal to Malar. General Locations of Places of Worship Malarite places of worship are said to be rare, though I would speculate that they are well hidden and or those who get to see them rarely come back to report what it is they saw. Regardless, they are usually placed in shadowed glades rather than held in any traditional building. Often fang-like standing stones are carved or hand-picked to form the circle around these glades. When Malarites need to hide, they establish their holy places within caverns beneath the given standing circle or beneath the foundation of one of their rare urban temples. Usually one can find an entrance to these caverns using a sinkhole placed in the middle of a standing circle. A network of tunnels usually are formed, and here the Malarites often let out and hunt those humanoids they have captured from the surrounding area. This is especially true during their high hunts. Specific Places of Worship Malar is said to be worshipped significantly in Thay. Though the following details I bring up are from a first edition book, so I do not know how true that statement may be now. Regardless, a large amount of Thayan rulers appreciate the desire for bloodlust as well as skill in hunting. As a result, copses found just outside Thayan cities serve as temples to the Beast Lord. Down on the fifth level of Undermountain beneath Waterdeep, otherwise known as Willowwood, are the remnants and evidence of a former Malarite group. The Archdruid who presides over this forest allowed the Malarites to hunt and reside for a time on this level until they began to run afoul of their invitation. They have since been eradicated from Willowwood, however the stone complex they used to live in, called the Deep Hunting Grounds, still stands. Within it may be still Malar's Tabernacle, the building which served as their primary place of worship. The roof of the building is lined with iron spikes, while stone carvings of various beasts and monsters are found around the top of the roof. The Twisted Run is a hidden shrine complex found to the northeast of Silvery Moon. It is a maze of underground tunnels and caverns. Prisoners are released into the Twisted Run to carry out the ritual hunts of the Malarite Faith. The walls here always seem to be damp and wet for some reason. There is also a magical claustrophobic effect tied to the shrine that falls over someone as they move through the run. Here Anth Malar, a chosen Malar, hunts or hunted as well but even he reportedly feared going too deep into the run. The Divine Den, found in Byzantil, is seen as a center, if not the center, of Malarite worship in eastern Faerun. This congregation of 70 Malarite clergy, along with their many lay worshippers, go out to many different places in Faerun in order to hunt exotic prey. The smiths among them make the true talents of the god, a magical and well-known version of the claw bracers the Malarite faith is known for. I will touch on these weapons in the magic items section of the podcast. I talked about the Wyvern Stones back in the Eldath episode, but they do deserve mention here in the Malar episode as well. The Wyvern Stones are a ring of standing stones, or menhirs, found within the Holak Forest. The Blood Moon Circle have taken over the Wyvern Stone as their own place of ritual and worship. The Blood Moon Circle are a sect of the people of the Black Blood. They celebrate their version of the Feast of the Stag differently. They hunt down humanoids and parade around the Halak Forest, holding the humanoid heads above them. They do this to attract and lead different omnivorous and carnivorous animals to the Wyvern Stones, where the animals are allowed to gorge themselves on the meat over two days. Survivors of the Blood Moon Circle's high hunts are invited to join the circle and choose which type of lycanthropy they'd like. 
There's much more to the Wyvern Stones, but those details are specific to Eldath and her faith, so seek that out in her episode if you are interested. The Bloody Rock is a shrine to Malara found near the northern edge of the Far Forest. The shrine has specifically been set aside to be a place of death for intelligent creatures only. The Bloody Rock itself is a 30-foot tall jagged rock formation jutting out of the earth. For whatever reason, the edges of this jagged stone are so sharp so as to cut the limbs of any who attempts to climb it. Surrounding the rock are standing stones that the Malarites believe Malar himself placed. Within the circle is another rocky formation called the Claw. The Claw is a curved stone with a flat top where victims meet their bloody end. No hunting in the area surrounding the bloody rock is allowed. Plus, the beasts who live in this area are said to be aspects of Malar. A beast of Malar prowls in the area as well. Aside from Malarites, seemingly all animals attack anyone on sight. Specific to the Bloody Rock is a particular rite whereby a ritual sacrifice is placed atop the claw, and a Malarite slowly wounds them over and over with the intent to bleed the sacrifice dry. The blood that falls from the sacrifice is drank up by the claw despite its stony surface. If the ritual is completed successfully, blood rock itself begins to bleed from many places along its surface. The blood is then gathered and drank by the ritual leader. The High House of the Hunt is a Malarite temple likely abandoned into ruin in the ruins of Zanto Keep. When it was active, it held an extensive collection of weapons of every sort, with some having been developed by the clergy there themselves. Several different poisons were manufactured within its walls as well. Still on the topic of Xanthal Keep, the Malarites here once claimed a formal guild house from the local leather workers and made it into a temple called the Lodge of the Great Hunt. The Malarites decorated in such a way to be reminiscent of a hunting lodge. Was a city long ago populated by elves within the high forest, Lothan still stands, but within its confines live orcs. These orcs, being worshippers of Hern, had converted the old elven temples to temples to Hern who is actually Malar. Beasts of Malar patrol around the bounds of the city, reporting to their evil druidic masters. The Jundar Wood is considered to be a holy site to, Mal- to Malarites, though as I mentioned in the Sylvanus episode, either Sylvanus' manifestations or Avatar lays waste to any Malarites who make their way too deep into the forest. Regardless, the Malarites stalk around here, taking out several non-Malarites. Claw Hollow in the northern area of the Moonwood is the territorial grounds for one of the most dangerous bands of the people of the Black Blood. The island of Moray in the Moonshade Isles is inhabited by a sect of Malarites known as the Black Blood Tribe. Likely these are members of the people of the Black Blood, but this is coming from a 4th edition book where information can be a little bit dicey at times. Either way, the Malarites have a shrine hidden in a secret cave under the Orc Skull Mountains. Here stands a glyph-inscribed stone slab where ritual sacrifices are performed. The Bone Dance is a rocky hill with a relatively flat top found in the border forest. This hill is thought to be haunted by the spirits of slain creatures as hunters report seeing dancing skeletons parade about the top of the hill. The skeletons make warning sounds and growls and give chase to anyone who dares to get too close to the Bone Dance. These are, however, just ghostly illusions manifested by a local group of the people of the Black Blood, known as the Rothor, in order to keep outsiders away from their bloodied altar to- atop the hill, along with the bones buried beneath the altar, which are unearthed to make use in the gruesome rituals of the Malarites. The Towers of Fury is a temple complex dedicated to all four gods of Fury in Kalimport. An unnamed temple to Malar can be found in Byzantur. A named shrine called the Bloody Hunt is found in Everlund. Unnamed shrines in Malar can be found in Suzale, Derloon, Hillsfar, Mullmaster, Calant, Westgate, Waterdeep, and Raven's Bluff. Character Options For 2nd edition, a breakdown for the towns, especially clergy and Malar's faith, can be found in the 2nd edition sourcebook Face and Avatars. An option for crusaders who worship Malar in the breakdown of the Beast Heart Priest can be found in Warriors and Priests of the Realms. For 3rd edition, the Black Blood Cultist Prestige class can be found in the source book Champions of Ruin. The Initiate of Malar feat as well as the Black Blood Hunter Vile Prestige class can be found in Player's Guide to Faerun. 
Following that is a breakdown of the features that I think someone deeply involved in Malar's faith as an accolade or otherwise would have for the background in 5th edition. For your two skill proficiencies, I would take two of the following, nature, animal handling, or survival. For your language or tool proficiencies, I would take proficiency in leatherworker's tools and woodcarver's tools. For your equipment, there's of course the acolytes from the player's handbook, but there's also the outlanders from the player's handbook, though using some of that gold that's given to the outlander to start off with the holy symbol. Finally, for your ribbon feature attached to each background, there's the acolyte shelter of the faithful and the outlanders wanderer, both from the player's handbook. Looking at the subclasses available from 5th edition, you could use them to create thematically appropriate NPCs or PCs to take if they are a worshiper of Malar. Now, at the time of recording, Tasha's Cauldron of Everything is out. I do not have a copy, so I cannot go through the various subclasses and ascribe them to ones that would be thematically appropriate for Malar. Either way, uh, we'll carry on. Uh, so for a Barbarian, there's the Berserker and Totem Warrior from the Player's Handbook, and Zealot from Xanthar's Guide to Everything. For the Cleric, there's the Nature Domain from the Player's Handbook. For the Druid, there's the Circle of the Moon Druid, and Circle of the Land, specifically Forest, from the Player's Handbook. For the Fighter, there's the Champion and Battle Master from the Player's Handbook. For the Ranger, there's the Beast Master and Hunter from the Player's Handbook. Then the Gloomstalker and Monster Slayer from Xanathar's Guide to Everything. For the Rogue, there's the Scout from Xanathar's Guide to Everything. Finally, there's the Divine Soul Sorcerer from Xanathar's Guide to Everything. Dungeon Master Options Before I get into specifics, a DM really could use a stat block of any predatory beast or monstrosity from the many 5th edition bestiaries. Rather than list them all out, just keep that in the back of your mind when deciding what creatures might be found in a group of Malarites or to be used by Malarites or to be themselves a worshipper of Malar. From the Monster Manual, there's the Displacer Beast, Owlbear, Periton, and Chimera. From Volo's Guide to Monsters, there's the Lucrata. From Tomb of Annihilation, there's the Commandon. Finally, from Ghosts of Saltmarsh, there's the monstrous Periton. Next, I will touch on some monsters from d d lore, which have not been ascribed any sort of stat block currently in official 5th edition sources. A beast of Malar is an evil predatory creature born out of Malar's divine realm in the outer plains and at least upon the surface of Toril. This creature is able to shift between three forms, a savage black panther, wolverine, and bat. It also has black glossy fur spattered with red marks, clearly made in the image of Malar. Stat block and more detail on this creature can be found in 3rd edition's monster compendium, Monsters of Faerun. Gargantua are monsters that clearly take inspiration from giant monster films from both the US and Japan. There are three variations of Gargantua, the reptilian, humanoid, and insectoid. These three in particular seem to be inspired by Godzilla, King Kong, and Mothra respectively. The stat block and more detail on these creatures can be found in 2nd edition's Monsters Compendium, Karatur. Wolf wares are a variety of lycanthrope who pass on their lycanthropy genetically rather than through the infection tied to the commonly seen version. They are just as vicious as their lycanthropic cousins, werewolves, though said to be a fair bit more charismatic. Regardless of any similarities, werewolves and wolf wares have a deep-seated hatred for one another and will attack each other on sight. Stat blocks for wolf wares can be found in 1st edition's Monstrous Manual 2, and 2nd edition's Monstrous Manual, and Monstrous Companion Volume 1. An Orum Borax, also known as a Golden Gorger, is a creature about the size of a large badger. Its name is derived from its golden fur. The creature is further differentiated by its eight legs, silver eyes with golden pupils, and copper-colored teeth and claws. These solitary and territorial creatures eat gold or to supplement their otherwise normal carnivorous diet. The golden jest helps to reduce the damage it takes to its hide. These beasts are sought after due to the defense its hide can provide if turned into cloak or clothing, though as well as for its beauty. The other parts of the Oran Varax hold monetary value as well. A stat block for this creature can be found in 1st edition's 
Monstrous Manual 2, Second Edition's Monstrous Manual, and I have provided a link to an official archive third edition web article where the RM Varox was spatted out for that edition as well. Fang dragons, which are also known as grey dragons, are one of the lesser known varieties of true chromatic dragons. They are greedy but intelligent draconic creatures with natural bony scales. Many of these scales rise to form spurs at its joints. It also has a forked tail that spl splits off into sharp bone blades that it sweeps like a scythe. Bone dragons have no breath weapon, using instead their deadly physical bodies to attack their enemies. That and their bite is capable of draining further vitality from its victims aside from just the physical damage it causes. Fang dragons can be found in 2nd edition's Monstrous Compendium Annual Volume 1, 3rd edition's Draconomicon, The Book of Dragons, and Monster Compendium, Monsters of Faerun, and 4th edition's Draconomicon 1, Chromatic Dragons, though they are listed as grey dragons in that supplement. Moving on to stat blocks from 5th edition sources, who could represent the various Malar worshippers and clergy? You can always swap out their spells for other spells more fitting to the themes you're trying to get at. From the Monster Manual, there are Werewolves, Wereboars, Were-Rats, the Acolyte, the Berserker, the Druid, the Jackalware, the Orc, the Orc War Chief, Orog, Scout, and Tribal Warrior. From Volo's Guide to Monsters, there's the Arch Druid and Archer. From Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica, though this is obviously not for the Forgotten Realms, there's a Druid of the Old Ways. And finally, from Waterdeep, Dungeon of the Mad Mage, there's the Werebat. Moving on to the last section of the podcast, and the last section for Dungeon Master Options, let's talk about magic items. The Talons of the God, as I mentioned earlier, are specifically created by the smiths found in the Divine Den. These are different from the other claw bracers in that they are enchanted and never rust either by natural means or magical effects. The smiths place small markings on each pair with which allow them to identify which smith among them made the pair. These weapons are blessed and enchanted, as they are placed into the blood of those creatures who have been slain in a given hunt. non malarites are able to wield these weapons, but malarites see this as deeply profane and will hunt down that given individual should they be made of such a transgression. The Book of Fang and Talons is the holy tome of the malarite faith presented in 2nd edition's Prayers from the Faithful. Unlike other tomes discussed from this source book in previous episodes, the Book of Fangs and Talons has a standard enough tome-like appearance. The pages of this tome are made of thick and heavy vellum. The cover of the tome is made up of two sea turtle shells which have an assortment of furs and scaled hides covering them. The binding of the book is decorated with an assortment of fangs and talons that seem to be replaced from time to time by the Malarites. The book contains 17 pages, each giving the particulars of an important spell in the Malarite faith. The tome has a ribbon to keep one's place in the book. The ribbon is made from cured and oiled red dragon tongue. Pressed into this ribbon is the holy symbol of Malar. It is an unwieldy and large tome that smells of various animal odors and death, though despite the natural material so much of the tome is made up of, preservative magics placed upon it prevent from any rot or mildew forming. The first record of the book comes in 937 Dale Reckoning, when an adventuring party found the book laying out atop Baron's Hill. Around the book was a circle of blood as well as a single paw of many different beasts, as well as a single human hand. Not one soul was to be found nearby in this eerie scene. This tome was taken to a priest of Sylvanus who was unsure of what this all meant. It was posited that it was tied to a powerful Malarite ritual gone wrong. However, not soon after, Malarites descended upon the priest killed him and took the tome. Rumors of this book, as well as similar scenes tied to it, popped every now and then. The trail then went quiet for a couple centuries until it sur surfaced in El Terrell, briefly in 1281 Dale Reckoning, when a Malarite clergy member teleported away, clutching onto the tome as authorities attacked the local temple to Malar. The last mention of the tome was in 1359, when Malarites were rumored to be seen parading through northern forests with it in hand. The fangs and claws that adorn the book are thought to be tipped with strong poison that will kill any non-Malarite who attempts to open the book. A belt of the beast is a type of Malarite holy item created out of preserved animal skin 
and embossed with animal motifs. But these belts give their wearer an animalistic attribute. There are 12 known varieties of these belts. A couple of them include chameleon skin, which allow the wearer to blend into their environment, and owl skin, which grant the wearer what we would know in 5th edition to be superior dark vision. The mechanics in greater detail on the Belt of the Bees can be found in the source book, The Ruins of Undermountain 2, from 2nd edition. A cloak of Malar is another Malarite holy item found among the faithful, mostly worn by the clergy. They are made from animal skin and enchanted with polymorph-like magics which allow the wearer to change into the form of a beast that matches the skin of the cloak. Much like the wild shape ability of druids, when polymorph the wearer maintains all their mental statistics. The Cloak of Malar's description can be found in the second edition source book, The Ruins of Undermountain 2. A Heart of the Beast is yet another Malarite holy item. These are often created by clerics of Malar, from the heart of a beast. The heart is smoked and then magically cured. This is a consumable item that confers greater attack bonuses to the person who consumes it. The Heart of the Beast can be found in the third edition source book, Magic of Faerun. A collar of animal control is a magical leather collar marked with runes sacred to Malar. Each collar in turn has a short iron chain leash. Once the collar is placed around the neck of an animal, the person holding the leash can command the animal to do what they desire. This magic item can be found in Dungeon Magazine issue 103. The skin of Malar is a minor artifact made from the hide of a beast of Malar. It is an extremely well-worded cloak providing a significant increase to AC as well as resistance to acid, cold, electricity, and sonic damage, and a base level of damage reduction on top of that. The skin of Malar can be found in Dungeon Magazine issue 129. The following are some thematically appropriate magic items from official 5th edition sources I feel the Faith of Malar may have access to. From the Dungeon Master's Guide, there's the Arrow of Slaying, the Berserker Axe, Boots of the Winterlands, Cloak of Displacement, Dagger of Venom, Eyes of the Eagle, Goggles of Night, Oil of Sharpness, Periapt of Proof Against Poison, Potion of Animal Friendship, Potion of Speed, Quiver of Elana, though it would need to be reflavored, Ring of Animal Influence, Ring of Free Action, Ring of Jumping, Rod of Alertness, Rope of Entanglement, Staff of the Adder, Staff of the Python, Staff of the Woodlands, Sword of Sharpness, Sword of Wounding, Vicious Weapon, Wand of Entanglement, Wand of Fear, and Wings of Flying. From Gilly Master's Guide to Ravnica, there's the Peregrine Mask, and you can make use of a reflavored Selesnia Key Rune. From Tomb of Annihilation, there's the Mask of the Beast. From Tales from the Young Portal, there's the Eagle Whistle. From Explorer's Guide to Wildmount, there's the Blood Axe, a reflavored Hide of the Pharaoh Guardian, and Weapon of Certain Death. From Horde of the Dragon Queen, there's the Insignia of Claws. You would just need to untie them from the Cult of the Dragon. From Waterdeep Dungeon of the Mad Mage, there's the Jade Serpent Staff. From Curse of Strahd, there is the Blood Spear. Finally, from Xanathar's Guide to Everything, there is the Boots of False Tracks and the Horn of Silent Alarm. Alright, thank you for listening to Religion of the Realms. If you're interested in keeping up with the release of future episodes, you can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and follow the podcast Twitter account at Realms Religion. These episodes are also uploaded to YouTube as well. The podcast YouTube channel can be found under Religion of the Realms. Audio versions of the podcast can be found on Spotify, Stitcher, and Google Play Podcasts. If you wish to get in touch with me with any questions or just want to chat, my personal Twitter handle is at ShivsEmbrace, or you can send an email to realmsreligion at gmail.com, all in lowercase. Having finished up all with the Gods of Fury, we will be next turning our attention to Selune, Shar, and Mask. We will first start off with an episode on Selune, the chaotic good goddess of the moon. Until next time, may Timor look kindly upon your dice rolls, Helm protect you, and Lathander light your path.
Music for this episode, Gloom Horizon by Kevin MacLeod of Incompetech.com, licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 4.0.